If you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn with me to the book of Acts. We're in the book of Acts, and uh, we've been going through uh, uh, the book of Acts, and we've made it to chapter 5. And uh, for the text, I just want to look in verse 32, Acts chapter 5, and verse 32, and the title of the message today is The Person-Driven Church. The person-driven church. So I want to look in verse 32. It's kind of a summary passage, and so we'll be looking at several places in this section. In verse 32, it says, And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. The person-driven church. A few years ago, back in the 90s, way back in the ancient days, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Rick Warren. Rick Warren pastored Saddleback Community Church out in California. He wrote a book that was a good book. It inspired many people. Uh, it was called The Purpose Driven Church. The Purpose Driven Church. One of the things he did in that book was is he highlighted the necessity of churches to have a purpose. Now, that sounds very elementary, but uh, it's amazing how off-center we can get. And uh, he, uh, he pointed out that churches that function without speci specific and stated purposes flounder around without accomplishing very much. There was a, another guy by the name of Jim Henry. Jim Henry is a former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Jim Henry is now retired, but I remember him telling one time, he said he saw a man out in front of the church and he was putting a for sale sign up in front of this church building and the doors had a chain around them and a padlock. And as this guy was putting up the for sale sign, Jim Henry asked him, said, what happened? He said, well, the best I can tell you is we went out of business. He said, why? He said, we went out of business because we forgot what our business was. Now, if you think about it and you ask the question, what is the business of the church? And in church, we regularly need to be reminded to keep the main thing the main thing. And it's real easy to get off track. How do you keep the main thing and what is the main thing? Well, we love fellowship dinners in this church, don't we? You can say amen anytime. It won't offend me. Uh, we, we, we love fellowship dinners, but fellowship dinners is not why we exist. We love special activities. Man, we, we, love, uh, we love trunk or treat. We love Thanksgiving. We love Christmas. We just had VBS, most awesome VBS we've ever had. I believe it was wonderful. You can amen anytime, I'm telling you. It won't, won't bother me at all. And uh, 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 we, we love those special things, but that's not the main thing. We can do all of those things and miss the point if we're not careful. You say, well, what is the main thing? Well, when the Lord Jesus gathered the disciples together on the mount before he ascended into heaven, he said unto them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the marching orders of the church. That is what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission. The Great Commission is declaring the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to the uttermost parts of the earth. When the Holy Spirit was poured forth, on the day of Pentecost, as we've been studying in the book of Acts, Jesus told the, the disciples to go and wait in the upper room until they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, until they were endued with power on high. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in power, was poured forth upon them. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus told them in Acts 1.8, He said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. And you will take the gospel to uh, Jerusalem, Samaria, um, to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so uh, they were instructed 
to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. They were not instructed to build buildings. They were not instructed to create projects. They were not instructed to feed the poor. They were not instructed to have committee meetings and gospel singings. All of those things may be fine in their place and may help get the gospel out, but they are not the main thing. The main thing, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the main thing. And so uh, we're talking about a person-driven church. A person-driven church is a church that at its core maintains the purpose of making disciples of other people. The, the person-driven church, the church that has Jesus Christ at the center and the object and the focus of all it does, that church at its core seeks to make disciples of other people. And so that's what we want to talk about this morning. Now, a little bit of background here. After healing this lame man, these religious leaders, primarily made up of Sadducees, gathered Peter and John together and the rest of the apostles and told them that they could no longer teach in the name of Jesus. And the church, however, continued to do so. As a matter of fact, if you just look back a few verses, it says in verse 12, at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. Now watch this. And they were all with one accord at Solomon's portico. Now, <laughs> that's, that's very important because of this. Solomon's portico was a long porch that went along the back edge, and it was very high. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Solomon built the temple, he had to import dirt and build up the mountain there because there was so much runoff, he had to actually create a foundation to build the temple on. So from the outside, if you're looking at Solomon's portico, it looks like you're looking up on a mountain. From the inside, you're in the temple proper. That is exactly where the Jewish leaders would gather. And so the disciples are in in one accord, in one place, and had they tried to hide themselves, they did a really poor job of it. Because there couldn't have been a more public place in all of Jerusalem than Solomon's portico. So the, uh, the, 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 the police, if you will, the, the leaders, the rulers, the religious outfit came to these guys and said, listen, we want you to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. No more of that Christian stuff. We don't want to hear that. They said, okay then. They go out to Solomon's portico. They get a bunch together. And what do they do? They preach Jesus. <laughs> so these guys take it serious. Their location means that they are going to take serious the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ that you shall be my witnesses. Why did they do that? Because that was their purpose. That was the reason they existed. Now, let me read you a couple other verses. In chapter 4, verse 19, they had gathered Peter and John together and told them they couldn't preach. And it says, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. I, well, you, you're telling us, you're ordering us, you're commanding it, you're making it against the law for us to preach. Well, go ahead, but we can't help it. We just can't help ourselves. In chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, we gave you strict orders to, to not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And in the text I read to you, in verse 32, Peter says, and we are witnesses of these things. So the purpose, the central truth of this message is this. The purpose of the church is to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of the church is to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want you to see two or three things about this early church. The early church was motivated. They were driven. They were consumed with witnessing to the grace of God through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, thus far in the book of Acts, I counted, referring to that little phrase, the name, the name of Jesus, referring to preaching of Jesus, 
Already, by Acts chapter 15, there have been 15 references to preaching the name of Jesus. The council commanded them to stop preaching in that name. And Peter says in chapter 5, they said, we arrested them, brought them up and put them on charges, actually put them in jail, but the angel got them out. And here's what it says. They went on their way from the presence of the council, listen to this, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, that introduction is all to tell you that the, 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 the early church, that a person-driven church. Their motivation, their drive, their determination, their goal, their intention was to proclaim the name of a person, and that person was the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want you to see some characteristics to a person-driven church. Number one, I want you to see the priority of a person-driven church. The priority. Now, as we've stated, the priority was to make other followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came, He lived, He suffered, and He died, and He rose from the grave. Jesus did all of that to win the hearts and souls of other people. Jesus was a teacher, but teaching was not his primary ministry. Jesus was a healer, but healing people's body was not his primary concern. Jesus was a miracle worker, but doing signs and wonders was not the main reason Jesus came. All of those things are great, but Jesus makes it real clear in Luke 19, 10. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. In other words, Jesus said, my whole purpose for Christmas and for Easter and everything in between is to save people's soul from eternal ruin. People are lost. People are lost. They're going to hell. And the purpose then of a purpose-driven church or a person-driven church, I should say, uh, the, the, the main priority is to share the good news about Him to them. You understand that? I, 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 the per, the person-driven church, the, the church whose priority is Jesus Christ makes it their goal, their ambition, their drive to share Him with them because they need him. Is that clear? All right, I, I knew I'd mess it up, but I wanted to get that right, all right? And so uh, growing up on the farm, we had many animals. I've told you about some of my peculiar animals growing up, but uh, my daddy had a pet milk cow. I, I didn't think y'all would find that weird. Uh, but, but he had a pet cow, and, and it was more of a pet than it was, but he milked her every day, and we'd give it away and everything else, and, 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 and it was his favorite cow. And uh, 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 that old cow, she was as tame. You could, you could pet her. You could ride her if you wanted to. Uh, but, but she was just docile. Never, never one time ever got a running start and jumped the fence. Never did one time. But was always getting away was always outside the fence. And Daddy was afraid she was going to get hit by a car. But you know how that old cow would always get out of the fence? Never did jump the fence, never did run off, never did try to get away. That old cow would just eat the next little tuft of grass. She would just see another, and she would just, she would just nibble her way over here and nibble her way over there and nibble her way over there until finally she had nibbled herself all the way into the neighbor's pasture. And you know, that's the way most people get off track in their spiritual life. That's the way most churches get off track in their programs and activities and focus and goal. It's not intentional. We just got a lot of things going on. We just doing a lot of things. We got a lot of activities. Some of them are good. They're not sinful. They're not bad. They're not wicked. They're not evil. But it's just the next thing. It's just the next thing. It's just the next thing. And then all of a sudden you look up, you're in somebody else's pasture. You're done way off base. And so we've got to keep the main thing, the main thing. And so the early church was that church that kept the good activities under wraps while they continued to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, 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 the uh, dedication of the early church is legendary. 
What motivated them? What made it so they were ready to die for their faith? I'm here to tell you what it was. It was a single relationship with a living, breathing, risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it was. Listen, I'll ask you a question. To whom and to what are you committed? Now, you got to be committed to some things. There's some things you've got to be committed to, and they're not bad things. You need to be committed to your family. You need to be committed to your job. You need to be committed to your career. You need to be committed to your church. You need to be committed to your friends. All of those things you think about, you plan about, and the reason you do is because you are committed and they are important to you. But let me tell you something. If you get those commitments ahead of your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to come a time when you're going to start living in fear. You say, well, why is that going to cause fear? Because, listen, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said the Gentiles seek after food, clothing, and raiment. He said they're always looking for how to clothe themselves, how to feed themselves. Jesus said, don't worry about that, but seek you first the kingdom of heaven and all of his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And listen, when you get that thing turned around, your life becomes filled with fear. When you make it your priority to seek those things, food, clothing, and shelter, and the kingdom of God as second, you know what happens? You, you start worrying about all those things you're seeking because they're eventually all going to slip through your fingers and God's going to burn them all up anyway. And so many people today are living in such fear because their number one priority is all of these things that they can't hold on to anyway and they've allowed Jesus to become secondary. Oh, beloved, listen, if we want to live a victorious life, we have got to put Jesus Christ as our priority for life. And so the priority, the priority of the person-driven church is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see the second thing. The second thing is the persecution of a person-driven church. Now these rulers, uh, the people, had already killed Jesus. I said they've already killed Jesus. Now the reason I say that is because we say that and it just goes right past us. I say that to remind you of how dead serious these people are. They're not playing. They're not playing. When they tell Peter and John, stop speaking in this name. They're not, they're not kidding around with these guys. They intend for them to stop. And it says in chapter 5, verse 40, they flog them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council. Now, this just blows me away. They went away from the presence of the council. Listen to this. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And, and this is what just gets almost comical. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus that he's the Christ. They just kept right on. You couldn't stop them. Don't you know that frustrated them people? We're going to kill you. Okay, where's a pulpit? <laughs> Eventually, Peter was crucified upside down. The Apostle John was exiled onto a prison uh, island out in the Mediterranean called Patmos. All the uh, early apostles were, were, were either fed to lions, sawed up, chopped up, killed, crucified. And their willingness to be persecuted was motivated by more than any old philosophy. Their motivation was more than an idea. It, it was more than a movement. Those early believers, they could not be bought, they could not be sold, they were not interested in lands, money, reputation, or fame. One thing motivated them, one thing was their drive, one thing was their, 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 their movement. They were not hindered by worldliness, they were not uh, swayed by worldly entertainments. One thing moved them, one thing mo moved them, and that was a person, a living, breathing, resurrected, coming again, ruling, reigning Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you in these last days in which we find ourselves, 
The more we speak truth, the more it's going to cost us. The more we stand for righteousness, the more vocal we proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. The more you say that, the more people are going to defriend you on Facebook. And you know what? It's just going to get worse from there. I, I believe, listen, I believe that we, we, are, we, are, we are real close to an attitude that promotes persecution toward Christians in this country that we live in. There's coming a time, this is 4th of July, I love the United States. I'd rather live here than anywhere. I've been to a lot of countries. I am not down on America. I am pro-American. But I want you to understand something. We are one election away from becoming a socialist country. Hey, I want to tell you something. Listen, you say, well, so, so what? What's the big deal? Let me tell you what the big deal is. Every, listen, you write it down, you studied, you go back, check me out on this. Everywhere socialism goes, the persecution of Christians follows. Everywhere, every time, without exception. And if you love the freedoms, listen, if you love the freedoms that you enjoy and you want to pass them on to the next generation, then we need to have churches that are on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ because that's the only thing that's going to stop and stave off the darkness that's coming. And when criticism follows, when criticism comes, when you speak for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is it that will keep a saint rock solid? What is it that when this wicked world threatens, how will you stand when that atheist professor stands before the class and he says, that old Bible that you like to read, it's outdated, it's filled with mistakes, it's hate literature and it's full of error. What's going to keep you from walking away from the faith when that happens? When, 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 what is it that, that keeps faith alive when doubts arise and fears dismay? What is it that will keep a, a, a child walking close to to God, what is it that'll keep you all the way to the end? I'm here to tell you, it's not a creed. It's not an idea. It's not a denomination. It's not your parents. There's only one thing that'll hold you when fears arise and, and, and doubts assault, and it is the relationship with a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And you know, we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We believe that. I believe that. If you believe that, say, I believe it. I believe All right, there you go. I, I'm trying to check y'all's pulse out there. Then, then the Bible says, the Apostle Paul says, sometimes we need to refocus. He said, I count, it, I count everything as lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. You know, they got all these dating apps nowadays. I'm sure glad I've got a beautiful wife and I don't have to worry about that. And if she ever dies, I'll just die single. Amen. Uh, I told her I'm going to die first uh, just to show her. Uh, but they got all these, all these dating things I hear about on the, on the radio. I, I don't mind people doing that. Uh, electronic dating. They got one that's called It's Just Lunch. You know, you just, it's just lunch. It's all it is. You go out to lunch. If you like them, you, if you don't like them, you never call them back. I guess I don't know. I, <laughs> but, it, but anyway, they're all looking for a soulmate. Need a soulmate. You know what a soulmate? That one person. That one person that I can so relate to, I can just, you know, just be me, me and them, you know, the soulmate, soulmate, single person. And, and I, I don't know much about that, but I do know that when I was a young man, many, many years ago, I, I, I wanted to date all women. I mean, that's just, uh, uh, it, it didn't matter, a single one didn't matter, you know, you just, just want, just, I don't know how far I need to go with this without getting in trouble, but. Uh, 
Well, well, well here's, here's, here's the deal. See, when I met Miss Cindy, all the rest of the women didn't matter no more. I, I couldn't see no more women, you know. I just what it just it didn't matter. And all of a sudden, what she wanted mattered to me, and what I wanted mattered to her. And 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 we became each other's priority. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to tell you when you fall in love with a person, and that person's name is Jesus, you don't have to worry about the world. You don't have to worry about the devil. You don't have to worry about all that stuff. All you need to do is keep your eyes focused on Jesus, and He will become your all in all. The early church, their priority was the Lord Jesus. I want you to see the third thing, and that is the prayers of the person-driven church. Now, this whole episode in Acts started with a healing of a lame man. And that was when Peter and John were first arrested, and they were told, don't you preach no more in the name of Jesus. And so they decided to have a prayer meeting. Now, everything from Acts 4 and everything that happens in Acts 5 is the result of the prayer meeting. But I want you to hear what happens at the prayer meeting. In Acts 4, 29, it says, And now uh, they're praying, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. That's what they prayed for. They, they're being threatened to be being put a, uh, under arrest and thrown in jail, and this is what they pray for. They pray that they would get more confidence to do more of what they're being put in jail for. <laughs> and while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. You got an instant answer to their prayer. Now it's almost comical how the early church responded to these threats. They said, Peter and John, stop telling people about Jesus. And so they go, they call the church together, they have a prayer meeting. And they say, now Lord, you deal with the threats. That's your business. You told us to witness. So what we're praying for is not for protection, not to get us out of this mess. What we're praying for is you empower us to do more of it. Folks, this is not people who are intimidated. This is not a bunch of scaredy cats crawling up in a classroom somewhere saying, Oh Lord, protect us and keep us off from harm. This is not praying that's saying, Lord, uh, we pray that you just lead, guide, guard, and direct us and bring us back at the next appointed time. This is not, Lord, heal my ingrown toenails and make my kids like each other. <laughs> do, do, do you see a, a, a qualitative difference between how we pray versus how they pray? Now, if this was us, I'm sure somebody would have said, Lord, put a hedge of protection around us. And I, there's not anything wrong with praying that. I don't want to belittle that kind of praying. But what I'm trying to tell you is they were not praying for protection. They were not praying for success. They were not praying for more finances. They were not praying for anything like what we pray for. They're praying for in your face boldness in the threat of people telling them they can't witness. This is warfare praying. This is gospel spreading warfare praying. The, the purpose of the church is to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their prayer was for boldness so that they could share the testimony about a person because they were a person driven church. My friend Rob Finley, prayer evangelist, made one of the most profound, simple, profound statements. Rob Finley says this. He said, evangelism begins with prayer or it ends. Now that's profoundly simple, but it's true. And the Lord Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Therefore, beseech. That means beg. That means pray. That means plead. That means ask. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into His harvest. The prayers of a person-driven church takes seriously the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to make disciples. The prayers of a person-driven church ask, listen, ask the Lord Jesus to save people. Now, wait a minute. They don't stop there. The prayers of a person-driven church ask Jesus to save people and then goes ask people to get saved. What a novel idea. Asking people if they want to get saved. Any of y'all ever thought of that? I mean, really. We just don't ask people if they want to get saved. Do you know what? The state of Texas. The great state of Texas. There you go. The great state of Texas passed a law recently that when you apply for a driver's license... You have to be mandatorily asked, do you want to be an organ donor? Do you know since they passed that law, organ donation doubled? Just because people got asked. That's profound, isn't it? Do you know how many people would get saved if we just asked them if they wanted to get saved? I'll never forget one time going on a, 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 an outreach visitation. I went to this man's house. He had been coming to our church for about four or five months. And I finally stopped in his house, went in, talked to him and his wife. And I started talking to him about church membership. I was telling him all about what it had to be. And he just stopped me. He said, don't you think I ought to get saved before I join your church? I said, well, yeah. That's a novel idea. James, the book of James, James says, you have not because you ask not. And the praying of a per person-driven church is not, Lord, get me out of this battle. But their prayer is boldness to do what the Holy Spirit has empowered us to do, that we might be witnesses. And then finally, I want you to see the power of the person-driven church. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, I read it to you, but I want to read it again. It says, and when they prayed, the place was shaken. They were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Miracles always follow the prayer meeting. I'm going to say that again. Miracles always follow the prayer meeting. I'm going to say it until somebody agrees. Miracles always follow the prayer meeting. Thank you very much. That is a profound statement, if believed. Miracles always follow the prayer meeting. Miracles follow authentic, spirit-led prayer meetings. Now, I've got to be honest with you. We haven't had a lot of good prayer meetings lately. And I'm ashamed to say that I believe we neglected public corporate prayer. I think we need to have a season of fasting and prayer. The early church, their prayers were corporate. They joined together to pray. They were fervent. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. They were united with one purpose, and that was to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and to declare His name to the world. My question is, can we seek God in corporate fervent prayer? We can if we want to. Should we beseech God for His grace that He might cleanse us? Do we need to cry out, oh God, purge us from our iniquities? We have an opportunity to ask our compassionate God that He might revive us and fill us once again with the Holy Spirit that we, like they, could speak the Word of God with boldness if we want to. And hey, you know what? I'm a Baptist, but I want you to know something. I'm a Baptist that believes in the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't believe in putting the Holy Spirit on display I don't want to turn the Holy Spirit into a circus sideshow. 
But at the same time, I believe the Holy Spirit is alive and well. And I believe that we need the Holy Spirit. You say, is the Holy Spirit for Christians today? You better hope He is because the Bible commands us to be filled with the Spirit. In uh, Ephesians 5, 18, it says be filled with the Spirit. It's a commandment. Now being filled with the Spirit is not like a glass of water being half full or half empty. Being filled with the Spirit, it, 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 it always is like, like that sailboat, you know, with the wind blowing the sail. The sail is filled with air and it propels. In other words, everybody is full of something. <laughs> now, some of you are full of love. Some of you are full of joy. Some of you are full of Jesus. Some of you might be full of jealousy or bitterness or apathy and indifference. What are you full of? I'm telling you how you'll know. Whatever's motivating you is what you're full of. Whatever's motivating you is what you're full of. And those early believers were filled with the Spirit and therefore they could not stop speaking about Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and, verse, and chapter 16, the Holy Spirit will testify of me. That's the job of the Holy Spirit is to point people to Jesus. Filled with the Spirit, Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Those early disciples were commanded by the Lord Jesus to go into the uttermost parts of the earth and to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the ends of the world. And humanly speaking, that was a total impossibility. Can you imagine the early church in Acts 1 before the Holy Spirit came? All right. Jesus said, go into the uttermost parts of the earth. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to have a committee meeting to talk about this. Let's get a subcommittee. Let's get a subcommittee. Somebody put together a budget. Let's formulate a plan. Let's get, who's in charge anyway? Who's in charge in this? Well, we need to elect a chairman. You know, I, I, it, it would have been months to ever get organized. And they still wouldn't have done it. Without internet, without telephone, without car, without satellite without anything they totally took the gospel to the ends of the earth within a generation you know how they did it they were full of the Holy Spirit they were filled with the Holy Spirit they gave themselves over to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit then empowered them when they spoke people listened that's what it is that's it's that simple and when they prayed the supernatural, invisible, earth-shaking power of the Lord Jesus Christ came into their heart and they were filled with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and they went out and made converts. And then finally, I want you to see the last thing and that is the persistence of the per person-driven church. Persistence. Acts 5, the last verse, verse 42, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus. That's the cry. They just kept right on. Talk about persistence. Peter, you, you preach another sermon, dude, and we're putting you in jail. Okay, I'll be over at Solomon's portico when you get ready with the handcuffs. I mean, if, if, if they pass a law saying you can't talk about Jesus, you gonna stop talking about him? I can tell you right now the discussions that are going to go on in churches. Well, you know, they said Caesar. You, uh, uh, give unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? And we're supposed to obey the laws of the land. So Peter said, you decide. Should we obey God rather than man? That's up to you to decide. But we can't stop preaching Jesus. <laughs> can't stop preaching Jesus. Are, are, are we, are we person driven? I had to ask myself that question. What motivates me? What motivates us? A person dri driven Christian is one who lives for Jesus Christ. A person driven Christian is one who seeks as their first priority the kingdom of God. 
The person-driven Christian is that person who counts all things lost as that they might know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings. The early church was a collective group, a congregation of saints who were dedicated and devoted to a person. And that person was the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in Acts 5, verse 14, And the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Why? Because they were dedicated, driven by a relationship with a person. And that person was the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Today, today we know this for a fact. The fact is, one, one out of every 85, one out of every 85 Christians will ever share their faith in Christ with another person. One out of 85 people who claim to be Christians, who've been baptized and are members of churches, one out of every 85 will ever tell somebody else the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, churches are full of worshipers. Maybe Maybe we need to refocus. I believe, I believe we, we want to. And the issue of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is of utmost importance. And the reason is because you might become dedicated to the church. You might become dedicated to the church without ever becoming dedicated to the person. We may become dedicated to the rules without ever entering into a relationship. And the purpose, uh, I mean the person of the Lord Jesus Christ should drive us into all that we do. I told you before about a little boy who was in the car with his mother and they were on the way to school. And on the way to school, they got behind a garbage truck and there was... They left the lift thing, the thing was open, the tailgate was open, the trash was coming out, and the man on the back, he flung himself across that garbage and was laid out like that to keep it from blowing all over the highway. And the little boy looked at his mother and she said, look, mama, somebody threw away a perfectly good man. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is, people are lost, headed for eternal ruin without Christ. Uh, this is true. They said out in the West, I, I believe it was uh, uh, Newport Beach, California. Newport Beach, California, they had city workers sifting through two and a half tons of trash. City workers went to work. They said, put your rubber gloves on, go out to the garbage. You've got two and a half tons of garbage you've got to go through. You know what they were looking for? Somebody at the bank had mistakenly thrown away an envelope containing $42,500. And so they were fervently sifting through two and a half tons of garbage to find that money. Would you sift through two and a half tons of garbage to find $45,000? Some of y'all would sift through a whole lot more than that. I'm not, let's just be honest. And, and I'm not saying that's wrong. But I do want you to think about this. How much of this world's garbage are you willing to sift through to seek and to save one lost person who's on his way to eternal ruin? And you've got the good news. You've got the good news. You see, the purpose of the church is to make disciples, to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have got to do that because God don't have any other plan. Would you stand with me? Bow your head and close your eyes this morning. While you're standing there with your head bowed and your eyes closed, 
There are several, uh, one, one, of, one of three ways that you can respond to this message. Number one, you can say, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I have never trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Today, I want to be saved. I want to know that if I died before this day was over, I would spend eternity in heaven. And the way to do that is to say a simple, heartfelt, sincere, no holds bar prayer to ask God to forgive you of your sins and to believe that Jesus died for you and he rose again and that he'll forgive you. And you say something like this, Dear Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. The day I turn away from my sin and I ask you to come into my heart and forgive me. The day I turn my life over to you. Did you pray something like that? Could you pray a prayer like that? If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord, would you just do that right now? Right now, while the church is praying for you, would you go ahead and just bow your head and receive Jesus as your personal Savior? Do it now. And maybe today you're a Christian, but you say, you know what? My, my focus is all messed up. I'm off. I'm off center. I, I, my priorities are not what... I, I'm not a... I'm not a person-driven Christian. I'm not a... I, Jesus is not my priority. Not my focus. So today, I want to rededicate myself to Christ, to a person. Not to the church. Not, not, not to my wife. Not, to, to Jesus. A person. Jesus. And you do something like, Dear Lord Jesus, I am sorry for allowing my life to get off track. Come into my heart. Make me new. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. And then today you say, well, I, I, I believe God wants me to be a part of Southern Calvary Baptist Church. I've been praying about it. I just think that's the Lord's will. And I want to help this church be a person-driven church. One, whose goal is to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. Father, today as we come before you, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your kindness. I pray today in the name of the Lord Jesus, if there's anyone saved today, if they pray to receive Christ, you give them boldness and courage to confess him before men. For any other decisions that need to be made, we pray it be made today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.